so fun. And if you're not smiling when you're surfing, you're not doing it right. Like I think is actually <laughs> kind of wrong. And I, and I think a lot of times, like what I find, what I really just enjoy like surfing by myself. And if I, if I'm just, just thinking or just feeling sad or, or whatever, and sometimes mm-hmm. I surf and feel really happy too, but um, I'm like, how many spaces do we have to just, I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. even have kids, but. We don't, I, I find it really hard to find this, especially during COVID when, you know, I'm, or people are like living on top of each other. Um, it's hard to have the space just to have your feelings. Mm. And I think surfing can like, can give you that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think also speaking to the oh, diver, I mean, speaking to the um, stigma is that's, that's part of the stigma is that I think the surfing is you're supposed to be stoked the whole time. Right. Mm. And you're just like the, right. the, the stereotype is the smiley, happy and so if uh, you're not that, then you probably shouldn't raise your voice is maybe the, is mm-hmm. part of that stigma, right? Just stay stoked and right. shut up. <laughs> yeah. I think that pressure to like be happy all the time is actually more harmful than it. You know, I think it causes, I think it's pretty harmful. Um, yeah. Because when you're not, then what's, what's wrong with me, you know? Mm-hmm. One, one other thought I have about this is like, if you're, if you're not able to do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself, and and like, I'm not saying like, there's a spectrum of this. Like if you miss one surf session, like, you know, because you're feeling bummed out, that's one thing. But if you're consistently not able to exercise or get outside or see friends because of your depression, then your depression is at the point where you need some help. Um, so, and I know that help's not always accessible, um, but uh, I'll, try, I'll, I'll try to give some resources at the end of this podcast, but um, it, it's time to start start looking for somebody to talk to a professional or, a, or a group. There's mutual support groups that are free. Um, so yeah, you, you might not be able to do it on your own. And I think that's a really, that's like a good cue. I can't do the things I need to take care of myself. Time to get help. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I saw some of the resources. I'm glad you're listing that. Cause that is also a barrier. It's a real barrier that people are, sure. don't want to get a therapist because it's, I don't have enough money. Mm. But, right. you know, I, I like that you're Expensive. listing these other group, you know, other low cost options. Also, yeah. I like this conversation about like this idea of being stoked in the, in the lineup. Also, you know, if we could be more kind of attuned to the idea of this diversity of emotion that we can bring to the mm-hmm. ocean. I just think about like when you get to line up and you have some aggro characters out there or some people, you know, like right. you, you have a lot of different things going on. I remember... Um, there's this guy with Tourette's that would be in the water and it would just be a little like, mm-hmm. oh, intimidating. But I just like, if we all can have this awareness, like everyone deserves to be in the ocean. You like, even the people who are aggro, maybe they're working something out. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes you need to like butt heads with them, but just like to let them be and to express what they need to express just this kind of like greater acceptance of, of the diversity of, of everything in the water, you know, just, mm-hmm beyond right. just like our our ethnicity and race and gender and whatnot, but also in terms of like our emotional landscapes, I think is, you know, in terms of accepting all of us as a community uh, in the water as well. Like mm-hmm. you said, to go to the, the ocean. Just that's to, a really good point. If you want to drift off and just stare at the gray sky, you know, like that's <laughs> that's your experience and it doesn't have to be like, come on, get back here and like do this or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is or... Um, uh, always right. to reprimand people who aren't like behaving and in the you know stoked way or right. aggro way or whatever it is, whatever is homogenous, you know. I think that's uh, right. Uh-huh. That's such 100%. a good point. I I do groups. I do groups um, with with um, teenagers, and I always have everyone. Like we always start with a check in just to kind of see where everyone's at and then acknowledge that we're all coming into this space. And some of us are feeling really excited and some of us are feeling really sad and like, um, but I've never thought about that in connection to surfing, but it's totally present. Yeah. (laughs) I try to have compassion because I'm like, I don't know what's going on in that person's day. They Mm might've had a really bad day and they, and just them being here is a big deal, even though it's toxic Mm -hmm. to all of us. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's like, if you're screaming at at people, what's, what's going on in your life? Um, that's getting you to that point over, especially over like, you know, three foot closeouts at Rockaway. (laughs) Three foot more Um, like a half a foot. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, this question is from a 29 year old surfer from Bushwick. Dear Shredder. 
I have never been more grateful to be a surfer in New York than during this pandemic. I am Asian American and grew up surfing in Southern California. It's been sad looking at the idiocy of the surfing community in some parts of California during this pandemic. It's sad to see friends and family bashing Gavin Newsom, who is by no means perfect, for orders to try and protect people during COVID-19. There's a certain cowboy mentality rooted in surfing, claiming waves, beaches, being a rebel. Fast forward to 2021, it's just sad edgelordiness in a sport that is grossly capitalist and environmentally unsustainable. Reflecting back, I've never thought much about the whiteness of surfing. Recently, I've remembered being called, and he uses a a racist term for Asians that I'm not going to repeat. Recently, I've remembered being called blank in lineups and blatant disrespect for etiquette in the lineup. It seems that most people think Asians are kooks and are okay to burn. In all this, I've wanted to speak up towards friends and family who are socially liberal, but generally conservative as fuck when it comes to surfing, masks, stay-at-home orders. When we look at surfing's history, it's rooted in the colonization of Hawaii, neo-Nazis, and shitting all over Indonesia. I want to talk to these friends, who are mostly white, but I don't want to make it about race. But maybe I do. What do you think, Shredder? Sincerely, Unpacking. There's a lot there, but I think it's interesting, the parallels of um, being Asian American and, um, you know, as a woman, uh, both of those culturally are, you know, you're not, you're told not to speak up and um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just not mm-hmm. really encouraged to be doing what he's asking, you know, should I speak up? And um, I think it's just so, it, it's easier said than done, but uh, I think what the Me Too movement has really brought to light for me is um, how, because I, I mean, I just remember having a conversation with two other women, very successful professional women, and we were talking about some of our experiences and and in all of them, we were like, did you, did you say anything? And like, none of us in the moment said anything. And mm-hmm. I think he's asking, you know, should, should I say something? I think it's so important to say something if you can in the moment. And of course, that's, like I said, easier said than done, but there's, um, there's ways of doing it, right. Of being assertive rather than aggressive and of using I statements. I don't know, Matt, you know, all of this, um, you know, how to do this uh, better than Mm -hmm. I do, but the, you know, when you make me feel this, um, or when you do this, it makes me feel this. And, um, I've Mm -hmm. found, because I've, I've been in these situations actually quite a bit and with even close friends, I have a text thread of women that, um, are mostly white. There's two Asians. There's three of us that are Asian on the list, but there's been some things that have gone through the wires there that I'm just like, Whoa, did they really just say that? And, um, I've, the way I usually approach it is I don't reply to the text thread. I just have a private conversation with the person Mm -hmm. and just being like, you know, when you said that, it makes me feel this. And, um, and I think usually they don't even realize it. And also usually they're thankful that you pointed it out, you know, that if you, if you can do it in a way that is bringing them in, showing a point of connection and that you're coming from a place of, um, just wanting to grow together. I think that's when it's, it's worked the best for me. Um, if you Mm -hmm. are, but if you just, yeah, but it, it's not going to change. Things aren't going to change if you don't speak up, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just Mm -hmm. not. Yeah. What do you think? I, I feel like there's like, there's two, there's two kind of cultural problems that this, this, um, that wondering is up against. And one is, you know, the white supremacist culture that we live in. Um, And the other is like, is friendship culture. Like there's an expectation Mm -hmm. in friendships that, um, you know, that you don't have problems. That's what, that's kind of like what almost what defines a friendship in our culture. I'm, I know there's an article um, that I'm referencing that I I should be quoting right now, but, um, but it's like, there's this, there's this idea that, you know, like we have conflict with our loved ones, with our family, um, 
and we stay in those relationships and we just work through conflict. But friendships are like in our, in our culture are supposed to, you know, we're taught that they're supposed to be easy breezy. And if problems come up, um, then maybe we walk away from them. So I, which is obviously like not a, um, not a great model for any kind of relationship. So I, I think that, um, mm. it's hard. It's just really hard to, it's hard to be in conflict with your, with your friends. Um, it's hard to talk. It can be hard to talk about things with your friends. And it sounds like this, this, um, person who wrote this letter is, you know, is talking about mainly their white friends and being an Asian, uh, being an Asian person and like, you know, bringing something up that's going to be uncomfortable, um, even with nonviolent communication, even with communicating an I statements, like it's, it's likely that the white people who you're talking to are going to, it's possible that they could be defensive. They could have a defensive cool. reaction and um, that it could cause some friction and tension. And that's just like hard and it shouldn't be your, your job to, to deal with it. Unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me. Unfortunately, it sounds like you're the only one in this, or you're the, you're the one in this, this group of friends that's aware of the, of the problem and sort of the position of, of the people who are, saying these edgelordy things, um, or have this edge, this, this perspective. So it, it kind of falls on you. Um, but it, it shouldn't be that way. Mm-hmm. I guess I just want to say it's hard. Yeah, no, it, it's hard. And from the perspective of the person, you know, calling someone out, I think it's also important to remember that just people are complex and you can be more than one. You can be both liberal, you know, liberal on some issues and then super conservative on others. I mean, Asian Americans as a whole are, are very, cons- are, you know, there's also a large faction of very conservative Asian Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that hopefully your friendship is at a point where it's okay for there to be those complexities and differences. Um, I guess the reality is that some of these things will eventually divide you or, or show people show you who people are and you know maybe that's a good thing but it's interesting Matt like you were saying you know like kind of it's like this overall culture of um like it's almost like single-use plastic right you just like Mm -hmm. like you just cut you off or the idea of like cancel culture right it's just like we don't go deeper than like oh that's what you believe in we're just going to cut you off you're you're toxic to me overdone and I understand that also sometimes you need to draw lines but um like our families, right? We can't just disown family members that they come with all kinds of other baggage and you have to accept it and through that you grow. So that is great. But I wonder how we could do that with friends and not have the onus of changing someone always or, uh, you know, addressing all these things be from the person who's sub- subject to it, you know, like right. that's just right. exhausting, you know? Totally. So, yeah, so finding allies, allies, I think that's also yeah. part of it is mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. finding someone who is like-minded and can and can talk to them instead of you right. um, mm-hmm. or can talk together or figure out a way how to address it together. Um, right. Yeah, but I, I just, I'm from like this. Like the story, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I just, but not, say, I think uh, just nothing's going to change if we don't speak up. Like, yeah. and I say that mm-hmm. and I've done, and yet I already gave you an example of when I didn't, you know, heard someone talking mm-hmm. about me being crazy and didn't say anything. So it's right. so much easier said than done. No, you do it when you can. Um, Again, don't, yeah, you know, exactly. you, you do it when you can. yourself and don't yeah. do it when <laughs> right. you know you're in harm's way also. Like, oh yeah, you no, that's do a good that, point. You know? That's a good point that uh, you could be putting yourself in harm's yeah. way. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And clearly like this story that they're telling about being a kid and being called racial epithets while surfing in LA, you know, like you're surfing in a, um, I think about surfing in San Francisco and like homophobic slurs being, being thrown at me or my friends in the lineup. And like San Francisco is like the queer capital of the world, right. you know? <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way people treat each other, you know, people treat people in the lineup. And this, this kid being in LA or this, when he was younger being in LA, um, I just think it's really a powerful story, just to, a, a reminder of what people are dealing with. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm really appreciative that they shared it with us. I, I also think there's this question of like, the, the, the end question is like, I don't want to make it about race, but maybe I do. I think mm-hmm. that it's not just about race, like using the approach Sachi 
recommend it of speaking, like, you know, just sharing the data of what happened, sharing the feeling that it gives you, and then sharing your thoughts about it, what, how you interpret what happened. Um, and including race as part of that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it sounds like from this, from this, um, 